Hello and welcome. Myocardial ischemia for a long time was believed to be a problem solely due to uh, stenosis of the main coronary arteries leading to heart pain or myocardial infarction. However, over the last two decades, more and more evidence has been raised that it's not only all on the big coronary vessels, but that microvascular dysfunction also plays a key role in understanding myocardial ischemia. I'm here in Davos, Switzerland for the 2015 Updating Cardiology Congress, and we have one of the worldwide leading experts in microvascular cardiac disease here with us in Davos, Paolo Camici. Paolo, welcome. Paolo comes from San Raffaele University Hospital of Milano, uh, Italy. Paolo, can you set the stage for microvascular disease? Sure, thank you, Gerard. Uh, it's interesting how all this started. It started in the mid 70s uh, when the coronary angiography became more and more clinically widespread. And uh, several groups, both in the US and in Europe, uh, made the observation that several patients who were referred for angiography because of typical anginal pain or ECG changes suggesting myocardial ischemia were found to have a normal coronary angiogram. Uh, so this puzzled people, as I said, in the US and Europe for many years, and several different hypotheses were um, put forward going from you know false positive to very exoteric explanation um, and this went on until the beginning of the 1990s um, personally I got involved with the problem because uh, I have expertise in the field of cardiac imaging particularly with positive emission tomography and uh, this technique, uh, among the other things, enables non-invasive measurement of myocardial blood flow. So you can actually measure flow in units of milliliters per minute per gram. And um, in, I moved to London to direct the, the PET unit in, in Imperial College. And uh, of course, as you do with any new technique, we began to measure flow in normal subject. And what you do, you measure flow at rest and during pharmacologic vasodilation with, uh, with adenosine. And we noticed that uh, there was a, a very wide range of flows, particularly maximum flow. And actually, there were some um, so-called normal individuals with very low flow. And um, uh, we made the association that in some of these individuals there were risk factor for coronary disease. So these people had no coronary artery disease but they were either hypertensive or they had high, high cholesterol. So um, it took uh, another good 10 years to put all the bits and pieces together and then we started to believe that because the um, the epicardial arteries were n normal in these people the problem was not a false positive but the problem could stem from the uh, so-called microcirculation and this uh, was uh, written down uh, four hands by myself and Filippo Crea in a review article that was published in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is highly cited, where for the first time we attempted a clinical classification of, of this problem. What is, what is the size of the problem, uh, Paolo? How frequent is microvascular disease as a driver for severe angina or even myocardial infarction? Well, that depends uh, on the on, on, on the criteria you use to refer for referring patient to angiography. Um, I mean, if the selection of patients for angiography, it's, it's good. Uh, then, you know, the percent of patients with normal coronary angiogram is no more than 5 to 15%. Um, 
in other areas uh, where maybe the criteria are less strict, as many as 40 percent of, of the subject undergoing angiography may, may come out with, with a normal angiogram. Uh, on the other hand, you can approach the, the problem from a different viewpoint and uh, look at the uh, classification. As I said, we classify coronary microvascular dysfunction into four main types. And type 1 and type 2 is the microvascular dysfunction that you find in subjects who have no evidence of coronary artery disease at angiography. Whereas type 3 and type 4 is the microvascular dysfunction that can be associated with coronary artery disease. So I think uh, for the purposes of this talk, I mean, the most interesting types are 1 and 2 when you have a normal angiogram. So, uh, as I said, not only you should suspect um, coronary macrovascular dysfunction if you have signs of ischemia, symptoms of ischemia, and you find a normal angiogram, but you can suspect this in subject with risk factors. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we talk about the pathophysiology, the drivers for, uh, for microvascular disease, and look especially to, to type 1 and, and 2 patients that do not have the classical uh, sure. atherosclerosis, what drives the disease? Is autonomic dysfunction? Are genetics involved? What is your current perspective? Well, I mean, the, the, as usual in nature, uh, the, 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 the factors are multiple. Um, for the sake of simplicity, we can divide these factors into three categories. One is when you have a functional derangement of the microcirculation. So these vessels is where most resistance to flow lies. These vessels respond by vasodilatation when oxygen consumption goes up to allow an increase in blood flow. So when you have functional microvascular dysfunction, you either have inappropriate vasoconstriction or less capacity to vasodilate. So this is the functional component. Then you can have a, a structural change. And this was uh, described by, uh, by, by German uh, physicians uh, several years ago, particularly in arterial hypertension, when you have hypertrophy of the tunica media that sometimes can impinge on the lumen. So you have a very thick, smooth, smooth muscle that brings to a, to a lumen reduction. And Falkov was the first to demonstrate this ultrastructural change. So functional, structural, and then you have f factors that act upon from the outside, uh, what we call extravascular component of pressure. And this is due to the force generated by cardiac contraction. And the, the prototype of this condition is aortic stenosis. When you have a huge pressure inside the ventricle, and this pressure is transmitted to the ventricular wall, and in turn, the ventricular wall will compress the small vessels. Mm -hmm. So these are the three main mechanisms. Let's take a, a quick look to, to therapy, therapeutic options that you have in patients with severe angina in the absence of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. What are the key treatment principles? Well, I mean, uh, this is a um, hot topic, uh, highly debated. I can tell you what my approach is. I think uh, uh, the best approach is to select the drugs uh, on the basis of what you think is the main mechanism. For instance, uh, if you have evidence of risk factors, uh, there is evidence that uh, if you use uh, um, statin, uh, you can improve blood flow. So uh, th there are studies where blood flow has been measured in patients with hypercholesterolemia before and after treatment, and there is quite clear-cut evidence that you can improve uh, microvascular function with statin. Um, very important field, hypertension, where you have these severe structural changes. Now, there is evidence that in particular, certain drug types, uh, such as ACE inhibitor, um, are able to contribute to reduce microvascular remodeling and again increase blood flow. Uh, there are new drugs on the horizon that are quite interesting. These are drugs that might 
interfere with um, with with contraction so they will either reduce heart rate or improve diastolic function and we believe that these drugs can um, improve diastolic filling of the coronary reservoir so act on this component of extravascular res resistance so, so this is uh, so it's important to identify the factors uh, that might trigger microvascular dysfunction and treat them so there, there is hope in the field with new drugs, there is hope in the field with a better understanding of the pathophysiology behind microvascular disease. Paolo, thank you very much for the interview. It's been a pleasure.